it just kills me. I mean, you used to be able to, you know. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Math 154. Halfway through the semester now, so we're calling this week eight lecture one. Per usual, we're going to go over some uh, due dates on our whiteboard. We're going to have a little bit of an extended detail talking about our project finally today, so we'll get into that a little bit later. But for now, your My Math Lab homeworks 3.2 and 3.3 we've already discussed previously. Those are due on the 14th and 19th, respectively. We will finish 3.4 today. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to very lightly talk about the concept of density, so we're going to have that due on the 21st. The next Excel file that you'll be responsible for, which we call 4.1, and in, in your My Math Lab assignments, you may see a 4.2 as well next to it, because one of them is the section and one of them is the Excel uh, assignment number. Don't get confused by that. It's the one from Chapter 4 that says budget. There's not another one from Chapter 4 that says budget, so don't sweat that. That will also be due on the 21st, and this is going to feel like it might be the same thing as a project, but when you get down to it, it's not. They're just both a budget, but they're very, very different. Uh, I'm going to skip this little line right here for just a second and come back to it. The midterm. So the midterm is still probably about two, two and a half weeks out. As we said in the beginning of the semester, the midterm will cover chapters one through four. Today, we will have finished chapter three, so we still have one more chapter to finish before the midterm. And remember that I said I'm going to give you about a week between finishing chapter four and actually uh, giving you the midterm. So again, the midterm is gonna cover the first four chapters. So it'll be, actually, it will be exactly one week after finishing section four four. I won't say exactly one week, it might be a plus or minus a day just because of how my, our schedules fall. The midterm will be either 20 or 25 questions. So they'll be either worth four or five points each, depending on how, we, uh, how many we go with. I kind of change it each semester. And there will be a very, very thorough review provided. You will find that review. It says in my math lab, actually, that's not right. That's going to be, no, that is right. That is right. And my math lab, or was that one in Canvas? I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember. The final is in my math lab. This one is in Canvas. I did not type that right this morning. So the review will be, the, 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 will be provided in Canvas. And you can see the next sentence. I even said that there. The review in Canvas will be much longer than the test. So while the test is either going to be 20 or 25 questions, the review is going to be about 60 questions. This is a quantitative reasoning course. I, just, I can't just give you a 20 question review and then copy paste that and call that the midterm. That's not how quantitative reasoning works. We have to learn to think, we have to learn to be analytical, we have to learn to deal with different situations. But what these 60 or so questions will do is narrow down what you need to study. So if there's a topic we've gone over in this course uh, that you don't see a question on the, uh, the midterm review for, then you know it won't be on the midterm itself. So again, the review will be provided in Canvas. So it's gonna be a PDF file that you can download and print if you like. And it's gonna be about 60 questions and in it you will see the questions as well as the answers. I'm not gonna give you any of the middle work. So you're responsible for connecting the questions to the answers. If you have trouble with this, I guarantee you with more than 95% of these problems, you can go back and find a homework problem that would be similar. You could find a problem, an, an example from class that would be similar. And remember the homework problems you have that help me solve this for you an example and all that stuff. There will be a, and I have three varies, so it must be very short, very, very, very short formula sheet provided that will also be in Canvas that you can print or just have available digitally when you take the midterm. This, this short formula sheet is not gonna have anything having to do with interest or finances. This is just going to be a couple of conversion formulas. So maybe something like 2.54 centimeters is an inch or 5,280 feet is a mile, things like that. And they don't have to all just be distance, but you get the idea. When we covered dimensional analysis, I had said that you are not responsible for memorizing any conversion formulas with the exception of time. 
you must know that 60 seconds is a minute. You must know that 60 minutes is an hour. You must know there's 24 hours in a day. You must know there's 365 days in a year. You must know that you can't say there's X days to a month because it varies from month to month. So I do make you memorize everything having to do with time, but anything to do with distance or volume, all that good stuff, that would be on a formula sheet. And I'm only going to give you a few because I don't want to give you 30, 40, 50 things and make you hunt them down for the one or two problems on the midterm that deals with it. So it's only going to be two or three or four formulas. So you won't have to comb through a bunch of stuff. Now, this midterm, when it becomes available, and again, you will get these dates sooner than later, but we're still working through chapter four. So I don't want to give it yet. This is going to be in my math lab, just like your homeworks. So it's gonna kind of feel like a homework assignment, except you can't open it and close it and open it and close it. You can't do a problem 50 times. You're, you're gonna to have to open it. You'll have two hours, 120 minutes. And then at the end of that 120 minutes, it will close out if you haven't finished. If you work for 55 minutes and you close it, that's it, you've, done, you've, you've already finished your midterm. So please make sure that you have two full hours available when you're ready to take this. So again, it's going to be available for only two days and we will be explicit on which two days they will be available. You cannot take the midterm late. If you try and take the midterm late, you're not going to be able to. We're gonna to have to figure out something uh, depending on your situation. If you have some type of medical documentation, we can work around that. But in general, I don't do makeup exams. Now, I'm gonna say this one more time, something I said earlier, this is a quantitative reasoning course. We have to reason, we have to make sense of things. What that means is we have to show our work. So you will be required to do your work on pencil and paper, or if you can somehow type it out, uh, go for it. But I think most students usually use pencil and paper. You are allowed a calculator, of course, that's how we do everything in QR, but you will have to either take a picture of your work with your name on it, a name, your name on each piece of paper with your work, and then you'll have to submit that in Canvas within 15 minutes of completing the exam. So I have to give this 15 minute timer so that we make sure there's no funny business going on. So where do you find your midterm? It's gonna be in my math lab. Where do you submit your work? That will be in Canvas. You don't see that spot yet. It will be available a few days prior to the midterm so we can get used to where it is, but you should be very familiar with the layout of Canvas now, where your links to the videos are, where your quizzes are, where your link to the project will be that we'll uh, be talking about today, all that good stuff. So any student who does not submit work for the midterm, I reserve the right to give a zero. I don't wanna to have to do that. Please don't make me do that. Please show your work. Do you have to show your work on every single problem? No, if it's a one-step problem, I understand that. If it's a two-step problem and you get it right, that's okay. But a lot of these problems have three, four, five, six, seven steps, and you can't just do these in your head. At least most of us can't just do this in your head. Also, when you're taking your midterm, maybe you have a simple typo. Maybe you make a simple mathematical error. Maybe there was five steps and you got four of the five steps right, and you feel justified that you should get four out of five points or three out of five points or something like that. Well, guess what? That's what the work is for. I'm all about partial credit as long as you have good work that shows you deserve some amount of partial credit. So you will submit your work. You shoot me an email and say, hey, Mr. Beckner, I didn't get any credit for questions seven and questions 12, but I believe I have some good work. Could you check out my work? And then I'll get back to you after a couple of days because I have a whole bunch of students doing this. And I'll say, well, yes, Bob, or yes, Jane, you did have good uh, work there. So I gave you partial credit and this is how much I gave you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you definitely wanna show your work because that's your key to partial credit. You definitely wanna show your work because that's your key to me not giving you a zero because with no work, how do I know you did your test yourself? So we'll talk about the midterm a little bit more as we get closer to it. I think that's good enough to go ahead and set it up for now. So let's go ahead and start talking about our project. And I'm gonna have a video ready to discuss the major details of the project. On that video, you won't see these dates. So make sure that you write these down right now. Uh, the file that we'll be looking at will be available in Canvas. It's already available in Canvas and it does have those dates in there as well. So project details, what are we doing? We are going to be making ourselves a monthly budget. So we're going to create an Excel file and this is gonna be from scratch. Remember all of our Excel homeworks, we've already had pre-formatted things where we just typed a few things, made a couple charts. This is us starting absolutely from scratch kind of like we did 
uh, the first week of class when we were just building up to what is Excel, how do we use it and all that stuff. So you are going to create a monthly budget. You are going to write down every single expense you have for the month of November, November 1st through November 30th. You will also try and come up with what we call prorated expenses that might pop up maybe once every three months or once every 12 months. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So you can write those down and those can go on any particular day. It doesn't matter which day of the month. So you will be budgeting for November 1st through November 30th. So every single expense you have in November, write it down and put it in this Excel file. Your project will be due and you'll be submitting it in Canvas on December 2nd. Now you might be thinking, well, Mr. Beckner, how do I, how do I get this thing done in two days? I won't even be able to do anything until, I, until November 30th when I put my last expense in. That's not true. You can actually create this entire file without putting in a single expense because it's just all about setting up formulas that will apply to all the different rows and all the different columns. Now, I don't suggest doing, you know, doing everything until you have at least a couple expenses in to make sure everything's working properly, but there's no excuse not to have this done on time. That little two days right there, that's not really how it is. You will have lots and lots of time to be working on this. Do not wait until the last couple of days of November to start everything. Do not wait until December 1st to start building your formulas. So what does that project look like? The file that you'll find in Canvas is right here, and you can see the due date of December 2nd aligns with what we had on our whiteboard, and you can see that the, uh, the days that you will be budgeting for will be November 1st through November 30th. And like I said, we're going to talk about all of this in our video uh, for class, and then once we finish talking about, actually, once we finish talking about 3.4 with our uh, density problems, then we'll get into this project details. All right, so like I said, we'll come back to that very, very shortly, but for now, let's go ahead and get our lesson. So we've done everything from chapter three, except for density, and here we are. So density is a ratio. Oh my, a ratio, what is that? I've never seen a ratio before in my life. Well, that's just a bold-faced lie if you're in this class. <laughs> um, ratio, fraction, so density is a fraction. As I've said, Everything from chapters two, three, and four on one level or another is some type of ratio. A lot of these ratios end up being proportions. We kind of extended the idea of proportions into things that you, we say we can't really do the fraction equals a fraction, but we can at least still relate them to each other. But another ratio, what is this the ratio of? It's, it's not just apples to oranges, it's not students to teachers, it's specifically talking about an object's mass to its volume. Now, I want to kind of point out here that very often we'll actually use weight to volume and you might be thinking well, Mr. Beckner weight and mass are the same thing and that is not true but it's also my point that most people feel like mass and weight are the same thing now as long as we stay on planet earth your mass would have a direct correlation to your weight and it would be consistent no matter what part of earth you're on but if we go to another planet, your mass would actually stay the same, but your weight would change because weight has, uh, is affected by the gravitational constant of the planet you're on. For instance, Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now you might go meters per second squared. Aren't things usually in meters per second? Good observation. Meters per second is a speed. Meters per second squared is an acceleration. So that gravitational force value, that constant of 9.8 meters per second squared, is not a speed, it's an acceleration. Now, we don't have to worry about what that means. That's not the point of this. I'm just trying to say that that number, that 9.8, if you go to the moon, it's lower. If you go to Mars, it's kind of in between Earth and the moon. If you went to Saturn, it would be much larger. If you were ridiculously close to the sun, it would be in the thousands or tens of thousands or millions, or I don't even honestly know, because I'm not trying to go stand too close to the sun. I'm not Icarus. <laughs> um so again, while your mass and your weight are technically two different values with two different types of units, and one of them is affected by the planet you're on, we kind of use them interchangeably. So when you're in England and you say, oh, I weigh 100 kilograms, 
that's a mass. But when you're in America and you say that I weigh 220 pounds, that's a weight. So the American system is a weight, but the non-American system, the thing that everybody else uses, is a mass. So that is the reason that I feel like most people find these two to be interchangeable. And you're probably not ever going to leave planet Earth in your lifetime. Notice I said probably. I can't make giant assumptions, but statistically it's probably, probably true. <laughs> so you're going to be like, well, mass and weight are the same thing to me. In fact, one country uses mass and another country uses weight. So why aren't they interchangeable? So again, if you're going to be in a science class, I would not be doing this, but in a QR class for just a concept of a ratio of something that measures your mass or weight to your volume, which is the amount of space you take up or, or an object, it doesn't have to be you yourself. So that's just the ratio. So if your measurement, if they give you a measurement in feet or inches or miles, not cubic units, like cubic feet, cubic inches, cubic miles, which is volume is always measured in, you're going to have to convert them. Now, this is pretty rare in most instances in the real world. If I give you some oddly shaped object, I would probably have to tell you what its volume is because you're not going to know the formula to find the volume of that shape. But in our class, I can say, oh, here's a cube or here's a box with these three dimensions. And then you could find the volume uh, by just using an appropriate formula. So I will admit this is not super necessary unless you're going between cubic inches to cubic feet if they ask for a change like that. Um, but I still want to remind us of the way we convert things that way. Uh, you can cube both sides of the conversion factor or you can also just multiply by the same factor three times as we saw in 3.1. So again, not really gonna focus on this issue here Although you'll think we are because you see this thing just says two feet. It doesn't say two cubic feet. And that's because it's what I alluded to earlier. We're only measuring one side and it is a cube. Okay. So let's get to the example. A box of supplies weighs 42 pounds. So we've got some box and, hold on, that pens being weird. We got some box, we'll leave a little space for the actual problem. Here's our box. Now, I'm going to assume this, is, assume this is a cubic box because it says if the box has equal dimensions on all sides. Now you might be like, Mr. Beckner, that doesn't look like a cube. Please ignore my poor artistic ability. <laughs> it's a cube. So this box weighs 42 pounds in total. The whole thing is 42 pounds. So if you put that box on a scale, it comes out to 42 pounds exactly. Now this box has equal dimensions and we get out our measuring tape and we measured one side to be two feet. So if you go from end to end, so again, from here to here, that height would be two feet. Or you could go from end to end horizontally, and this width would be two feet from end to end. Or if you measured this distance right here, this distance would also be two feet. So it's two feet by two feet by two feet. And I know this doesn't look like two in comparison to this, and that's because we're looking at this box mostly from a forward perspective. So we're just barely peeking around the corner to see that it's an actual three-dimensional shape here. All right, so the box has equal dimensions, and they say, what is the density of the box? And I say, note, you still need to convert your units, but it's not going to feel like a conversion problem. It's just going to feel like finding a volume because the density is the ratio of mass to volume or weight to volume. We're going to use weight. Again, this is not technically true, but good enough for a QR sake. <laughs> um, so again, I said you have to convert your units. But that's just because we got to find the volume based on the fact that it's a two by two by two box. So the first thing we're going to do is find the volume, which is two feet times two feet times two feet. How do I know that? Because the volume of a cube is length times width times height. That is a geometric formula. I do expect you to know the volume of a box is length times width times height. I'm not going to ask you to memorize the volume of a sphere or a cone or a three dimensional triangle or any kind of, or pyramid, I don't know why I said triangle, <laughs> uh, pyramid. 
I'm not going to ask you to memorize any of those goofy shapes, but you do need to understand the basic concept of two-dimensional and three-dimensional shapes. Area for a rectangle is length times width. Volume for a box, length times width times height. Now check this out. The two times two times two is eight. And some, some person might say this is eight feet, and it's wrong because you have feet times feet times feet, which is feet cubed. It's like having three times three times three is three cubed, or x times x times x is x cubed. So that's it, there's our volume. So how do we find the density? The density is just the ratio of mass or weight, whichever you're given. Again, technically it's only mass, but in here we can use weight as we're about to do. So how do I know which way to divide them? Do I do weight divided by volume or do I do volume divided by weight? The formula says the volume goes on the bottom. If you do these backwards, it's wrong. Volume must go on the bottom. So the eight feet cubed or eight cubic feet must go in the bottom. And the weight, which we said was 42 pounds or the mass if we had it in say kilograms, was the 42 pounds. Again, like I said, it's very interesting because pounds is a weight, but kilograms is a mass. Your mass in kilograms is the same on the moon, is the same on Jupiter, is the same on Mars, is the same on Earth, but your weight in pounds would be different because they take into account the gravity. I know it's weird, just go with it. So we do 42 divided by eight, and let's see how if we have to round it all. Spoilers, we won't. We get 5.25. So 5.25 is the answer, right? Maybe if we're not a quantitative reasoning student, no. As a quantitative reasoning student, that's wrong. 5.25 what? 5.25 oranges, 5.25 bobs. 5.25 oranges per bob? No, it's 5.2, that's an ugly two, isn't it? Five pounds per cubic foot. Or you could write it with the word 5.25 LBs per cubic foot. Um. Hello. That looks like a two, but it's a three. I had some gunk on my tablet, apparently. <laughs> There's our answer. Again, the either of these is perfectly fine. Both mean the same thing, whether you write the units in fraction form or with a per form. So what does this mean? What is the point of this problem? What's the uniqueness of finding a density? Or what's the reasoning to find a density? I don't know why I said uniqueness. Let's say this box was filled of just one object. It's filled with a bunch of marbles or something like that, like that or a bunch of sand, or I, I don't know, a bunch of very hollow beads, whatever. So this box is filled to the brim with the substance, and you go, well, I just hurt my back, so I don't really want to carry 42 pounds right now, but this is two by two by two. What if I were to maybe slice this box? So I'm going to slice this box. Like so. Gotta be careful this way. So that each of these little red boxes is one foot by one foot by one foot. So again, this right here, each of these, oops, I got a little crazy on that one, didn't I? Just trying to emphasize this little cube right here. which of course has, if you wanted to see through the cube, there's the whole thing. That's a one by one by one. And there would be eight of these. There's one here, two, three, four in the face. And then on the back side, there's one, two, and then three, and then four behind it. So there would be eight of these little one by ones. One by one by one. And each, would have 5.25 pounds in it. That's what you can do with the concept of a density. You can break this down into smaller things. Now, do you have little one by one by one boxes? Because you certainly can't just take an open box and <laughs> go from a two by two by two to a one by one uh, to eight of these one by one by ones. You'd have to have eight 
one by one by one boxes. But again, let's say 42 pounds is too much for you to handle with your back and, and this, you know, bigger, more awkward two by two by two box. So you go, all right, well, let me instead buy eight smaller boxes, fill them up with this equally distributed object. Uh, and then you'll have eight boxes with 5.25 pounds. And if you took eight times 5.25, guess what you get? 42 pounds. That kind of goes in line with that concentration idea that uh, whether you have one box with 42 pounds, that's two by two by two, or eight boxes that are one by one by one, 5.25 pounds in each, you still have the total amount of the thing at the end of the day. Now, if you're filling these boxes with DVDs and weights and water jugs and things that are not equally distributed, you'd have a much harder time doing this equally, but you could at least still say, let me go get eight boxes and just try and put about five pounds in each and then everything would be, uh, again, much easier to carry on your poor old back or young back. Maybe you had an accident. I don't know. Lifting too much weight at the gym from all that protein powder from a chapter ago. So densities of objects in the real world are not always equally distributed, like I said. If you have a box full of beads or sand or something like that, it's all the same thing and it's filled to the top, then that's an equal distribution of weight most likely. But if you've got a box with a 10 pound dumbbell in it and a calculator in it, you're not gonna be able to equally distribute those weights if you try and put it in two boxes, one box with the 10 pound dumbbell and one with the, what did I say, a calculator, I think? <laughs> Obviously, the calculator box is going to be lighter because those weights don't have the same densities. Think about it like a balloon versus a bowling ball. They, you could have a balloon the size of a bowling ball, but the bowling ball is a lot denser. The material inside of it is heavier. So even though they're the same size, they have different densities because their sizes, while the same, their weights or masses are different. So the bowling ball is denser, whereas that balloon is very, very, very not dense. All right, so with that said, that will close out chapter three. Just give me a second, I'm setting up for our project discussion. Right, so I wanna take a solid amount of time and talk about our project. Now, I know this is project one. It could be our only project. It could be one of multiple projects. It just depends how the course is going. Um, and I would have uh, said this to you. You will find your due date in the intro of a live lecture. Uh, as well as in Canvas, and the Canvas due date will be the whole time. Uh, this talk is just to keep things a little more generic for uh, my various classes since I teach this more than once each semester. So let's see what we've got here. Each student is responsible for creating a monthly budget of all of their expenses for the month of, and just a couple <laughs> words I might have to take out for the month or the month assigned. Now, it does not have to be a specific month. Now, you notice that I had November written there. So once in the past, it was the month of November. I've done the month of February. I've done the month of June. I've done split months, like say January 16th to February 15th, or December 20th through January 19th, something like that. So that will also be something that is detailed in Canvas and in the intro. You'll find this file in Canvas where it will have your exact dates. So each student is responsible for creating a monthly budget of all their expenses for the month assigned. And again, it doesn't have to be just a February. It could be a split month, like we said, March 15th to April 14th, something like that, maybe. 
If you do not spend money regularly, you need to ask your parents or your spouse or whoever you have close to you who is basically giving you the financial assist what they are spending on you each day. Now, some parents or spouses or brothers or whatever uh, might consider this to be nosy and they don't want to tell you these numbers. And, you know, that's the lifestyle that they cho choose to live. I, I would love for all of us to be in a society where we can openly talk about our finances a little more, but I'm also not going to tell anybody what to actually do with their lives, as you already know. So, you know, besides do your homework, <laughs> that's what I will tell you. So if you are in a situation where someone does not want to tell you what they're spending on you, then you can see I have an all caps of sentence after that. Just make up your own numbers if absolutely necessary. Um, I'm not going to be grading this based on, oh, you spent too much on uh, video games this month, or you spent too much on your car, or you spent too much on this, or too much on that, or too much on this, or you didn't spend enough on this. That's not what the grade is going to be about. The grade will have absolutely nothing to do with the expenses. The grade will be based around, did you do the six things that I asked for that we'll slowly go over? Did you use Excel formulas appropriately? Did all of the calculations, uh, you know, add out, correct, multiply out, correct, you know, whatever operations they're supposed to be doing? Did you make your charts? Did you make an analysis? That's what you're going to be graded on. I don't care if I have student A who has $10,000 worth of expenses in a month and student B who's got $10 worth of expenses in a month. That's not what's being graded on. Again, it's did you actually do this task? What the the purpose of this is for you to have something that you can use the next month and the next month and the next month and the next month to keep a good record for yourself to understand where your money is going and where it's coming from each and every month, as well as to, uh, I don't want to say introduce the idea of prorated expenses, but to kind of get you used to them as well. So again, this is not going to be graded on the fact that you oh man, you only bought seven things this month or you bought 200 things this month. That's not what's graded on, although I do have some minimums as we'll see. Rows should be the days of your month. Columns should be your different categories. The furthest right column should be your total daily expense. Now remember, rows are horizontal, columns are vertical. You have to get this right. Every semester I get maybe one, maybe two students who get this wrong and you get punished in the point department because of that. So row one, row two, row three, row four, row five, row six, column A, column B, column C, column D. So again, what we've said, let me just kind of shrink this so we can see a little bit of everything. Rows should be the days of your month. Row one, row two, row three, you can see those. Columns should be your different categories. Column A, column B, column C, column D. So if your project was supposed to start on say December 1st and end on December 31st, which I would never have done because that would be over a break for standard semesters, but just let's just say that would be the case, then you're probably not gonna start in this block because you're gonna have to have a column uh, a column of you know labels and a row of labels for these things. So actual data doesn't really like numbers and things won't get put into until you get into like this section and further right and further down, of course. But again, you must have your rows and columns labeled appropriately. If they are flip-flopped, you will be penalized for that. And it won't be a small penalty either because, I mean, this is two of six issues of the whole thing. So I could arguably take up to about 20 points for that. Okay, if you have more than 19 categories, so what's a category? Well, a category is what you decide to call it. I'm not gonna say that everyone has to have a category called rent. I'm not gonna say that everybody has to have a category called mortgage because some of you have rents and some of you have mortgages. You could just you know, call it roof if you want to. I'm not going to sit here and analyze the name of the category just to make sure that you have something that represents, well, you should be paying for, quote, roof somewhere, probably, <laughs> unless you've inherited a house. And if you have, you still have your taxes and insurance. So you could you know, still call that, quote, roof or rent or 
mortgage or house payment or whatever you like. So if you have more than 19 categories, because some of us have lots of various expenses, and especially if you decide to have a category for fast food, a category for dining out, a category for grocery bills, uh, another person might just have one category and call the whole thing food and lump all three of those together. Some of you might just have a category for groceries and then another category for all other eating. So eating at McDonald's or eating at Olive Garden or eating at, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I was going to try and think of some nice little local spot, but it doesn't really matter. So again, one student might have three different categories of food. Another student might have two categories of food. Another student might have just one category of food, but everyone better have a category of food because we all got to eat <laughs> and food is not free. All right, so if you end up with more than 19 categories, I don't need you to go into 20, 30, 40 different categories because then your Excel spreadsheet is gonna get really, really wide. So just call the last one, the 20th one, miscellaneous, and then lump everything else into that. And again, I don't necessarily care how you're dividing this out. I don't care if the food category is before the rent category or vice versa. It's just if you end up needing more than 19 categories, call the 20th one miscellaneous and then just lump everything in there. Uh, whenever you have a miscellaneous expense, if you could, um, to the right of that total daily expense, you could just make a little memo and say, hey, this miscellaneous expense uh, was for, I don't know, paper clips, <laughs> or this miscellaneous expense was for a calculator. I don't know. Some of you, I would say probably half of you maybe won't even have this miscellaneous category because you only have 10 or 12. Please note that I say there is a minimum of six categories. If you do any less than six categories, that's when I start to take away points from your grade. Now you might be saying, Mr. Beckner, I only paid for three things this whole month, so make it up then. Again, if you can't meet these minimums or you can't get the information from someone, then just make it up. But understand that in your life, you will be paying for this stuff eventually. So have this sitting to the side, uh, ready to go once you can start building your own expenses and your own budget. So you make made up numbers are okay for now, but just know that you should try and use this in a real fashion at some point. Um, and by the way, uh, if I haven't already made this clear, I do not care what your numbers are at all. Uh, when I go to grade these, I, I have a method to grand to grade them completely randomly as long as you don't stick your name inside of the Excel file in a cell somewhere. So I'm not going to be sitting here judging you for your expenses or anything like that. Your grades will 100% be based off of completely uh, anonymous information. And again, I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, well, yeah, Alex is spending uh, $400 on this product and, and Jane is spending $1,000 on that product. And look at Bob, he's spending a, a $100 on lottery tickets every month. Get out of here, Bob. No, that's not what I'm doing. Again, I have no judgment here at all. We are all in different financial positions and I really do not care about your expense portfolio, your monthly budget, any of that stuff. Um, I just want you to use this for your personal growth. And when you're done with this course, months from now, years from now, if you don't want to use this exact format of an Excel spreadsheet for your budget, go online and find a website that has something uh, that could be helpful. There are, there are a bunch of different budgeting websites out there, and I'm not going to advertise for any of them at this moment, but I'm pretty sure Google could find you one pretty easily, one or two or three or four. <laughs> um, so again, for the categories, you can combine some things. We've kind of talked about pet food. You can expand some things. It's up to you how specific or non-specific you want to be, as long as you have at least six categories. Now, categories can be lots of different things besides food and rent. You have medical expenses. You have vehicle expenses. You could break down the vehicle expenses into multiple categories. You have insurances. Um, I've said medical stuff already. You have textbooks you have to buy. You've got uh, courses you have to pay for, um, clothing, food, investments, if you wanted to call that an expense because it would be um, paying off a loan, paying off your credit card. Uh, you could be a, a category as well. Okay, so hopefully that clarifies that. Now, if your expenses vary wildly from month to month, which if they don't now, they will at some point in your life, especially if you own a home, <laughs> uh, medical expenses, 
you know, you break a leg, all of a sudden you got a couple thousand dollars to pay. You know, you need some fancy surgery, even with insurance, ten thousand dollars. So that would be a case of something varying wildly. If you own your own home and you got a really bad leak and you get the inspector out and it turns out he goes, well, you know, this roof is 29 years old and it's seen about uh, 15 hurricanes. It's time to replace this. And then that's, you know, six grand, 10 grand, 15 grand, depending on your home, uh, depending on whether you're doing the uh, construction or hiring it out, that kind of stuff. So yeah, your January, you might spend $1,000. Your February, you might spend $1,200. Your March, you might spend $800. And then April, that roof bill comes in and your $1,000 monthly bill is now like $1,100 because you got 10 grand on top of that. You might say, well, Mr. Beckner, I'm getting a loan for that. So you know that's not gonna be technically an expense. Then I just add in that loan payment. Sure, but you could also maybe have saved cash away because you know these big expenses come up eventually and then you're able to just conveniently slap 10 grand down on the table, get your new roof and no loan, no, you know, no paying three or five or 10% APR <laughs> monthly payments for five years, 10 years, who knows? And then by the time you get that loan paid down, it's time to slap another roof on the house, <laughs> who knows? So what is the point of this ramble, this rant? So if your expenses vary wildly from month to month, consider every possible expense you have. Things like your car insurance, your taxes, your doctor's visits, your prescriptions, your house repairs, car repairs that could be done in quarterly or annually or semi-annually or all sorts of different installments. So car insurance, a lot of people pay this twice a year because if they pay it monthly, they have to pay just a little more. There's a basically a premium bump. But if you pay it semi-annually, which means every six months or twice per year, then they might save you like 30 or $40. And in the long run, that can be worth it. All right, so if your car insurance comes in January and July, that means you might have like a $400 bill in January, but then nothing February, March, April, May, or June. So it seems like your January expenses are significantly higher, but that's because you're paying this big lump sum in January that's gonna cover you for February, March, April, May, June. So let me give a simpler example. Let's say that your car insurance was pretty cheap and it was $360 a month. At least that's cheap relative to a, you know, someone in their mid thirties and, and male and doesn't have a horrible track record on the road. Uh, someone else, maybe $720 is cheap. But let's just say you paid $360 for six months worth of car insurance. So if you take that $360 and divide it by the number of months it's covered for, so you're doing dollars divided by months, you would get a value per month. It's a simple rate like we talked about in chapter three. So 360 divided by six would be 60. So your $360 you pay in January that covers you through January, February, March, April, May, June, in reality, is much more like a $60 expense January, a $60 expense February, a $60 expense March, and 60 in April, 60 in May, and 60 in June. You just have to front the cost. So for myself, if I were the student doing this monthly budget and I have my own monthly budgets, and this is exactly how I do it, I would not say that I paid $360 in January. I would say I paid $60 in January. And then in my February budget, I would have that $60 allocated. In March, I would have that $60 allocated, and I would have, quote, prorated uh, car insurance. Now, again, in reality, when that bill comes, yes, I'm $360 broker <laughs> in January and then again in July, but we set that cash aside throughout the previous five months. That way, when we're ready to pay it, it doesn't feel like it's a big deal. And then over the next five months, we build that $360 back up so that we can pay the 360 again in July. And then through July and uh, then July through December, we save another 360 to pay it in January. Vehicles, staying in uh, this realm, okay, you're, you drive your car for five years, 10 years, whatever, all of a sudden, um, you need a new timing belt or timing chain after 100,000 miles or whatever your vehicle might uh, require. And they go, oh, okay, well, if you're gonna do the timing belt, we might as well do the water pump while we're in here for most cars. And all of a sudden you've got a $1,000 or $1,500 vehicle expense. And you go, oh no, well, I wasn't expecting this. What do I do? Well, 
you consider the fact that you know your car is going to cost you a lot of money at some point. So just like that insurance, you're setting aside maybe $100 a month or $150 a month. And you won't be able to guess this exact number with, without life experience and being used to the, the same car. But with practice uh, and manipulation, you can get this whittled down better. So, oh, okay, I'm going to put $100 away a month, $100 away, $100 away, $100 away. Now, this is oil changes and tires and random breakdowns and whatever. So after three years of me storing away $100 or you storing away $100, now some of that money has been taken out for oil changes and tires and inspections and whatnot. But then hopefully when that when it's time to replace that timing belt and water pump and whatever else they're going to fiddle around with, you've got that $1,500 sitting in the bank because you consider these prorated style expenses. And you can say, oh, well, I don't necessarily, yeah, I have this $1,500 expense in the month of March, but in my monthly budget, I've been setting aside 100 or 150 or 80 or whatever many dollars. So that's what I'm talking about if your expenses vary wildly. Now, some of us this is not an issue, so don't worry about it. But again, just know that in your future, this is likely to be you as well. Um, the written, now I orally talked about um, taking a semi-annual uh, car insurance and turning it into monthly. Here you have a vehicle property tax of $240 per year. Now there's 12 months in a year, so you divide by 12. So that gives you $20 per month as a rate. So vehicle property tax is another thing that comes in typically once per year. You're not paying your vehicle property tax monthly unless you're in some weird situation that I have not seen before. If you outright own your own home, you're not making a mortgage payment, which I know is not a lot of people out there, but your taxes come quarterly or every other month or semi-annually depending on the city. Your insurance bill comes annually. So these are other expenses that you might want to prorate. So I've said that this idea of prorating your expenses is not mandatory, but it is highly recommend, recommended for your personal life to consider things like that. So again, prorated expenses, a very, very important concept moving forward in your life, uh, especially for the idea of storing away some acorns for a rainy cold winter day or something like that. Now I do say that I need you to list at least one prorated expense in your budget or lose 20 points. I used to actually do an entirely second part of this project, um, which people messed up more than actually got it right, unfortunately. So I've kind of axed that and just said, all right, you have to put at least one prorated expense in there and please make sure that I know which one it is. So have a little memo somewhere. It says, hey, this expense on March 1st or this expense on January 1st or this expense on August 15th was my prorated expense. So that is a significant point loss if you don't do it. Now, once again, if you don't have any of these expenses, if you are living off of someone else and they won't tell you these numbers, they won't tell you how much your rent is, your portion of rent, what it would be if you were paying it, or how much your gas bill is, or your electric bill, or water bill, or trash bill, or anything like that, just make it up. I don't care. I'm not going to call up your parents and say, did Bob actually spend $25 this month on blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you can completely lie to me about every single number. Again, that's not what I'm grading you on. All right, so I did mention earlier, I wanna pop back up here uh, with the rows and the columns. The rows should be the days of the month and please make sure the month and the day are labeled. Remember that there are quick ways in Excel to make that progress without having to type out 30 or 31 of those. You just have to do one or maybe two, and then you can use a fill handle probably, depending on how you format things. But I said that the furthest right column should be your total daily expense. So this is another thing, if you miss it, that's significant points lost. So maybe on, on January 1st, you spent $5 at the corner store, and then you spent uh, $20 on groceries. So there in that total column on the far right column, it should say $25. Now, it shouldn't say $25 because you literally typed 25 there. Remember, total columns in Excel are meant to be used with formulas. You should only have to type one formula for that column and you should be able to fill it down. If you don't do that, you will lose 100% of the points for that total column. So if you're typing a different formula, for each row, if you have a, if you type a formula for January 2nd, and then you type a formula for January 3rd, and then you type a formula for January 4th, 
That's wrong, 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 wrong. You should have only had, if your month was January, you should have only had to type a formula for the month of January, or sorry, for January 1st, and then just fill it down for the rest of January. Easy as that. Just like we emphasize with the Excel homework. So here's something I need you to understand with that. I might go in your Excel file and completely change your numbers and I'll say, nah, Bob, Bob didn't spend $20 on groceries that day. He spent $25 on this other category. And I'm going to watch your total column and see if it changes. And if it doesn't, then you're in trouble. Or I can just, you know, double click on your formulas and see what they have. And I can instantly tell <laughs> whether it's right or wrong. But I just need you to understand that. This is supposed to be set up for super easy future use. So when you use this for the next month and the next month and the next month, you just put in, oh, on February 15th, I had $15 of groceries. On February 16th, I spent $40 on my cell phone bill. And then all those totals just change with a snap of a finger. All right. So we said the last column should be a total of daily expenses down here on spot number four, um, which means number three is this. I don't know why that changed. One, two. Yeah, there we go. Three. So here we are at four. Your last row should be the sum of each category. The last row should be the sum of each category. So this means I want to see what your monthly expenses are for your groceries. I want to see what your monthly expenses are for your fast food, or I want to see what your monthly car expenses are, however you're labeling your categories. So that way, if you went to the grocery store five times on this very last row, you can see how much you spent on groceries that month. Or if you have a column for fast food and you hit up Chick-fil-A, uh, let's say 23 times, you're going to see how much you spent on Chick-fil-A or all your fast food altogether. And then some of these numbers might scare you a little, and that's half of the point of this. Because these small expenses that you might do every day add up. So you'll have a total column and you'll have a total row. The column would be the sum of the days. The total row would be the sum of a category. Next, I want you to create a pie chart, big fan of this for budgets, that will include every expense category with the exception of the sum of daily expenses. We've talked about with pie charts why you don't want to have you know, the regular categories and then a sum category. This was very early in the semester. So your pie chart should just be based on the categories using the totals from, from part four. So in other words, you will create your pie chart based off of the last row, which is the sum of each category. So your pie chart is only based off of a single row, the last row, and it's the sum of each category. So that way you'll have a slice for groceries, you'll have a slice for cell phone bill, you have a slice for rent, you'll have a slice for, again, however you're labeling your categories. Now remember with pie charts, the idea here is that pie charts give you a visual representation of percents. So when you are labeling your pie charts, when you go through that labeling process, make sure they are labeled as expenses. I'm sorry, as percentages. So in the pie chart, I don't want to see that you spent $1,200 on your rent. I want to see that your rent was 31% of your expenses. I also need to make sure, you need to make sure that your charts are well labeled. So when you have your pie chart, if they just say category one, two, three, four, five, nope, you're going to lose points for that. It should have, all right, the red one is food, the green one is your rent, the blue one is your car expenses, the orange one is your medical expense. Not those specific colors, the specific categories get the point, I hope. So this is the bulk of your work. You got to have your specific days and month, days of the month, or months if we split the month, labeled. You've got to have at least six categories, at least six categories. You need to have a, a column for your totals for each day. You need to have a row for the total of each uh, category. You need a pie chart based on that total for each category, labeled appropriately. And then the very last thing we have you do is a quick analysis. And this analysis can go anywhere in the Excel chart. Keep it in the main section of the screen. Just, just find one cell, click there, and type a sentence, a paragraph whatever. Please don't just type two or three words. At least I at least need a sentence. Uh, a paragraph would be cool, but a, a sentence or two is perfectly fine. 
So make an analysis of your monthly expenses. So this could be you saying, I think I'm putting enough away to my investments or my savings account, or I think I'm spending uh, too much on my <laughs> Carrera GT or whatever. I, maybe I need to spend less on my rent, or maybe I need to spend less on fast food, or maybe I need to spend a little bit more on this category because my clothes are ratty or something. I don't know. Now, I don't need to know any kind of checking account or savings account numbers. This is not a, a budget where you're starting out with, oh, I've got $500 in my checking account and adding and subtracting that. No, this is just showing you what you've spent in a month. So this is not necessarily having to do with incomes. Now, outside of this course, could you modify it to do that? Yes, absolutely. That would be a great idea to modify that. Um, and then, so, you make your spreadsheet and say it took up all this space. And then you, so that, let's say this was January and then you say, all right, well now I wanna do this for February. So you use the plus sign, you go back to sheet one, you can copy all the information there, paste it here. And all you'd really have to do is change your uh, days and, and months and maybe your categories, I don't know, delete the old numbers and put your new numbers in. And then that total column should still be adding everything up correctly. Your, your total row should be still adding up everything correctly and everything will be fine. And then you can go to March, and then April, and then May, and then June. And I've had students say, well, that's annoying to have to keep copying and pasting. It's, well, that's less annoying than starting the whole thing over, I'd say. <laughs> so again, what I really like about this project is that it's going to get you to become aware of what you're spending every month, because I find that most people are not aware of this. And that could enable you to say, oh, well, maybe I'm spending too much on this one category. Like, I will even spoil this one that's very common as, man, if I spend a little more on groceries and cooking at home and a little less on dining out or fast food or Starbucks coffee or anything like that, maybe I could take that money and put it somewhere else, like a savings account or an investment account or put it towards a future car or a future, <laughs> you know, anything because as we will see in uh, these later chapters when we really start talking about compound interest, small savings each day, each month, each year over a long period of time when invested can turn us into a millionaire with enough time, effort, and knowledge. So that little $3 you might be saving yourself a day, if you can do that for 50 years, you can make bank off of that as long as you're doing the right thing with it. You're not sticking it in a, uh, a CD or you're not just leaving it in a 0.01% uh, interest rate checking account, something like that. Okay. Oops, wrong thing. That's not what I wanted. Ignore that. So... You will be submitting this in Canvas. You also find the downloadable file that you, we were just looking at in Canvas. So when you log into your Canvas shell, I'm in the student view right now, uh, you'll see about halfway down under your quizzes and everything, there's that project category. And if this is not available yet, just give it one more day and it should be available. And obviously yours will not say fall 2020, that is the past, I'm just using this as a visual example, but you'll see two main spots in the project you'll see one spot for the actual file to download. So if I click this, it would take me to the page where I'll see that and, and be able to download it. And it would be this, except it would have your actual due date here. It will have the specific month that you're gonna be working on here. So those details will be seen in the downloadable file of Canvas. Under that link, you will see the link to submit your project here. Now this has to be an Excel file. It cannot be any other fancy spreadsheet file. As we've talked about all semester long, it does need to be an Excel file. This is not auto graded. I will have to go in and grade these. So it'll probably be a, a week or week and a half before I get to these because I get a lot of projects all at once and they are time consuming to grade. So please be patient with me in that regard. But that's where you'll submit it. So you'd click there. 
and then you hit the button that says submit assignment and then it'll take you to a screen where you can just upload your file it's pretty uh clear and then the due date it's back not gonna work back didn't work da, 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 da. and then again your due date it would be seen here just so you know and again i will always say those due dates at the start of live classes they can be found inside of canvas so hopefully that's not too confusing okay so last time through this really quickly you will make a monthly budget you will have your rows be the days of your month columns be the different categories if your rows just say one two three four five not good enough Need slightly more detail than just one, two, three, four, five. Columns are your categories. How many categories do you need? At least six. How do you break them up? However you like. What do you do if you have no expenses? Make them up. What do you do if you're trying to get your parents to tell you your expenses, but they won't? Make them up. Uh, if you go online, I'm sure you can find... <laughs> uh you know rent prices home prices things like that monthly uh you know payments whether it's a thousand dollars for this apartment or fifteen hundred dollars for this house they, that could help you get a ballpark idea now let's say you live in a house of four people and the rent is sixteen hundred dollars a month what you could do is you could prorate that to yourself so you could say all right it's sixteen hundred dollars a month for four people that means my quote portion of the rent would be four hundred sixteen hundred divided by four so you could do something like that again if you're a, a kid or a brother or spouse or sister in a situation where you're not earning income and again someone doesn't want to actually tell you the numbers we said that uh, i would love for you to try and prorate some of your expenses but i did say you must list at least one prorated expense and mention somewhere in the excel file which one it is that's a significant point loss if you don't you have to have your sum column, which is the sum of the days. You have to have your sum row, which is the sum of categories. You have to make your pie chart. That has to be listed as percentages, not dollar values. That chart has to be labeled, not just one, two, three, four. It has to be labeled rent, food, car, health, whatever. And then somewhere you have to just make a sentence to paragraph analysis of your monthly expenses. I'm not going to take away points if i disagree with your analysis <laughs> i just i'm just gonna say hey did they write a sentence or a paragraph did they actually look at their inf the information they have all right cool full credit that should be the easiest uh of these six sections to get complete so again you'll find your due dates in canvas typically this is about uh five to six weeks after it being assigned so just please understand that uh if we're, we're live like i said i will tell you those due dates at the beginning and or end of the class if i don't mention it right now and if you have any questions you can always email me about this but I think everything should be pretty clear and concise. Make sure this is your own work. Make sure you are starting with a fresh Excel file. Do not go to the internet and try and download something and copy paste it. Things will look weird. I'm not grading on like colors and bolding and shading and borders or anything like that. So, you know, gonna put some numbers up here. So Bob turns in his Excel file and he's got everything labeled uh, up here. Everything looks good. And it's just that the whole point here is just the numbers are not bolded. They're not extenuated. They're not colored or anything like that. That's not what I'm grading on. Bob would get 100 if all the formulas are correct. Everything's labeled appropriately. They've met the minimum standards. Okay, so Jane does this. Jane has different numbers, but I don't feel like changing them. But Jane decides that she wants everything gridded like this. Okay, I don't care. I'm not grading on that. And then maybe Alex comes in and he decides that he wants this column to be orange and then he wants this column to be yellow and he wants this column to be green. Again, I'm not going to be grading on that. You're not being graded on anything having to do with color, outlining, bolding, shading, none of that stuff. 
you are graded, graded on all the details I have talked about on that sheet. And again, you can download this sheet from Canvas. So hopefully we all understand what is necessary. All right, so that will be the end of the project discussion. And just as a reminder that this is actually what it will look like in your Canvas shell. Remember, it's gonna be due on December 2nd. The dates that you will specifically be collecting your budget details for are November 1st and November 30th, whether it's your information, your parents' information, whether you just completely make it up because you don't want me to see your numbers, I don't care. Just have something available, have a decent amount of stuff available. And then showing our due dates one last time before we close out class. You can actually get out a couple minutes early today. 3.2, 3.3, and 3.4. So all of chapter three has been finished. We will begin chapter four next time. The next Excel assignment that we'll have, that 4.1 budget is due on the 21st. Same with 3.4 homework. We already talked about the project details. And we have our midterm. You also have that pay attention quiz uh, that was due on the 14th. So don't forget that. That is still an active quiz. All right. So besides that, as always, if you have any questions, please email me. Please stay on top of your work. Please do not wait until the last second to start uh, dealing with your budget project. Things don't go well when that happens. So keep working hard, study hard. We will see you next time. Take care, everybody, and have a good day.